Buenos días. Muchas gracias, Peter. Good morning. I'm still asleep, but it doesn't, it's not a problem, I'm here. So welcome to the first part of the paper presentations this morning. It's very nice that we're talking about the visuals, especially after last night's anger rave, in which we could enjoy both things together. And now we're going to have feedback on the uh, connection between uh, visuals and sound. So let's, we have uh, four papers today. And the first paper, that's how it, it's called. <laughs> And uh, it's uh, by uh, many, a, a lot of friends wrote this paper. So I'm going to let you introduce it. And welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Just checking. Yeah, it's all working. Morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Guy John. Um, I'm going to be presenting this paper. We do have a slightly snappier title than the original one now. Uh, this will be Towards Improving Collaboration Between Visualists and Musicians at Algo Raves, a discussion of performance best practices. Um, there were quite a number of authors and contributors on this paper, um, so I'd just like to point out I am one of at least nine people. Please don't give me more credit than is due for just being the one up here speaking. Um, it was somewhat of a, an uh, experiment in collaboration as well, in the sort of uh, uh, in, with the idea of being if we're talking about collaboration, maybe we should collaborate on a paper. Um, it's been an interesting experience. <laughs> so this originally stemmed from a discussion uh, that happened at the Top Lap uh, meetup in Sheffield in September last year. Um, there were a number of discussions that week around uh, how visualists and performers can, uh, sorry, visualists and musicians uh, can work together. Uh, one good discussion started by Antonio Roberts, uh, and a number of us continued this uh, and then decided that maybe it would be worth writing a paper. Um, and it ended up being partly about the sort of social problems and solutions of being a visualist working with musicians, um, and also some amount of the technical uh, issues that some sort of visualists will often have to deal with. Um, for those of you who haven't been to Sheffield, I would really recommend it. Um, so a lot of the discussion took the form of creating uh, a mind map of sorts um, so that we could try and, uh, you know, figure out what was linked and so on. Uh, the result is that the paper, like I said, has the social component and the technical component. Um, it ended up being uh, raising more questions, I think, and so there's certainly some areas of research out of it that we want to sort of continue. Um, but yeah, hopefully in this talk, I'm, I've tried to pick out some of the succinct uh, solutions that we sort of think may be worth looking at immediately. Um, yeah. uh, it's also worth bearing in mind uh, that the, uh, it's, it's a very algo rave centric uh, view of visualists and musicians working together. Uh, it's been very interesting for me being here. Uh, this is my first ICLC um, and seeing uh, sort of everything that uh, people are doing, uh, but also seeing how uh, some people's opinions to me feel like they're very based in either specifically audio visual performances or in algo rave performances. And, there do seem to be differences between the way that uh, sort of people treat those. Um, it's also worth pointing out that it's a very UK-centric point of view. Um, certainly, personally, um, also the, the majority of the contributors uh, were from the UK as well. There were some from Japan, um, but it's sort of uh, very geared in that culture. Um, and so it's been great as well speaking with other visualists and musicians from other cultures and seeing that they, some of the things that we thought were potential issues don't necessarily seem to be in those cultures. Um, and we'll come back a little bit to that. Um, sorry, yeah. So it's worth pointing out that uh, Algorave, um, sorry. yes, um, yeah, Algorave Center View Performances, um, certainly in England, the sort of influence is very uh, 90s club culture. And so there's always been that view of uh, the music being the primary reason that people go to algo raves, um, or at least, sorry, go to club nights out, uh, and how that algo rave has carried over some of that baggage. Um, and kind of that means that maybe the visualists in some ways have had a slightly lower billing um, or lower importance uh, than the musicians have. Um, and so it's worth thinking about that in terms of uh, how that changes um, 
you know, how algo raves, uh, what happens at algo raves. Um, yeah, essentially, everybody wants to dance. The rave part is very important. Maybe the visuals are less important. Um, and there's a few effects that this does have on being a visualist. Primarily, this kind of thing happens a lot. Uh, two minutes before a set, I'm doing visuals for who? Oh, am I? Go and speak to them. Um, and this has been a, quite a recurring theme at a lot of the algo raves I've done um, and a lot of the algo raves that sort of a couple of other visualists in the UK have done. Um, so yeah, as well as that, uh, I mean, a lot of just general organizational issues. Being a visualist and being seated right at the back of the um, club, uh, not being anywhere near the musician, suddenly communication is very, very difficult. Um, as well as this just, uh, if you're trying to do any sort of syncing and so on, sorry, was it syncing? Yeah. Um, any syncing between the machines and the musician and visualist, uh, this can be quite difficult to set up, especially if you're a long way away. Um, and we discussed sort of some of the ways that this can be improved um, and some of the, the sort of further issues there are, are with this. Um, and so again, I just want to say, this is a very Alba-centric point of view. It was very interesting hearing the keynote from Alba um, and talking about the aesthetics of sort of where people would sit um, and how that, to me, felt different because it was, seemed a very audio-visual sort of centric uh, point of view. Um, whereas to me, Alga raves feel different. I, I'm interested to speak to other people about whether that is uh, how they see things as well. Um, a few other initial thoughts. So I can't see my uh, notes very well, unfortunately, which is a bit annoying. Um, so yeah, one of the things that actually was uh, really good to hear from other musicians uh, sort of at Alga raves is that they like having visuals. Like they do feel it adds to the night and it always feels a little bit uh, awkward to me personally going to a musician asking, do you want visuals? It may take up some of the space you'd usually have your code displayed on. Is that an issue for you? Um, and so it was quite positive knowing that they like what we do. Um, uh, yeah, it's also worth pointing out, not every musician will want their want visuals with their uh, code music. Some of them uh, prefer just to have their own code displayed. Um, and obviously as a visualist, that's fine. There is an aesthetic choice there. Um, and it's important that uh, the way that they present what they're doing uh, is sort of valid for how they want to display it. Um, but yeah, and again, these were sort of some of the initial thoughts from those present. Uh, I'm interested to know how this sits with other sort of cultures and algo rave scenes. Um, so uh, I want to start off with sort of the social side of this. Uh, it's worth pointing out some of these may kind of seem obvious in hindsight. Uh, I mean, some of the organizational things certainly, um, but I mean, Personally, as they're not best practice at the moment within algo rave scenes, maybe it is worth just reiterating them. Um, so I want to talk about uh, specifically the algo rave that was at Dina in Sheffield, which is part of the Top Lap meetup. Um, and I think it's a good example of a fairly typical UK algo rave. I also want to stress it was absolutely excellent. The Top Lap uh, guys did a really good job of putting the night on. It was really good fun. Um, and we also get great designers doing these good posters. Um, I just want to talk briefly about, so here was the list of artists, uh, loads of people doing really good stuff. Of the 30 or so artists, there were only four visualists. Um, and this is kind of a recurring theme, certainly in the UK. Uh, so, is, so Bruce Lane um, had already agreed on a performance with Simon Vanderwalt, and so he was actually only performing a single set. Um, this meant that there were three visual artists um, who ended up doing visuals for almost all of the rest of the artists. Uh, and so that would be Hello Cat Food, who's Antonio Roberts. Um, Wispy, who was uh, a thankful late addition. We recruited him the day before, so unfortunately he wasn't on the original flyer. Um, and myself. Uh, and this meant that across the two rooms with the other 30 or so artists, uh, there was a lot of running around and, do you want visuals with your set? How are we going to set this up? So uh, yeah, that's kind of a recurring theme in uh, a lot of our algorithm scenes. Um, so yeah, and so what this often means is that uh, finding out who you're playing with as a visualist beforehand is quite difficult. Uh, and it means that suddenly collaboration goes from uh, it's something that can be planned out beforehand to something that has to be very immediate. I am always going to be reacting to the musician because th they have no idea who I am um, and they have no idea what kind of visuals they can expect from me. Um, and so some of the obvious ways of addressing this are organizers making sure that people know ahead of time who is going to be playing at the Alga Rave, who is actually going to be playing with each other. Um, oh, sorry, but then also the point that uh, 
visualist, maybe we should just be better about speaking to specific musicians, asking if they want to work together, and then actually approaching organizers with a piece. The other obvious answer is that we should just recruit more visualists. Um, if there are more visualists, then suddenly us running around is less of an issue, we hope. Uh, oh yeah. Um, sorry, I really wish I could see these notes better. Uh, yeah, oh, sorry, so this is just reiterating that often musicians don't necessarily know what is going on with the visuals. Um, if you've never spoken to somebody before, then you know, how can you know what you can expect from them? Um, it's also worth pointing out as a visualist, it's not necessarily a downside if the musician has no expectations. Um, it gives me a lot of freedom to do whatever I feel is suitable for the performance. Um, and that can be a lot of fun if you know, I, I can take the reins off a bit and go for it. Um, so one of the other things that came up uh, was that if I am going to collaborate with a musician, musicians already have this great vocabulary of, uh, sort of terms and phrases they can use to describe what they do. Um, but often it's uh, very couched in musical language. And it was really interesting hearing Kate Sikio talk about how she's interested in uh, sort of creating a language around specifically choreography um, because she feels that that's important to be able to talk in those terms. And also hearing the Bellico team talking about how important uh, sort of that language localization is to being able to express what you want to do. And from a visualist point of view, uh, whilst I understand all these musical terms, uh, it would be good to be able to talk in slightly more freeform terms about uh, you know, what I am able to do uh, and what the musician can do and kind of meet somewhere in the middle. Um, really obvious examples are just instead of talking about speeds and tempos, talk about moods, talk about colors and so on. Um, and it's one of the things that actually uh, is sort of a number of us thought would be a good sort of direction for further um, research. It's not groundbreaking. Again, these things seem obvious, but nobody appears to have talked about them, so maybe it's worth pushing that. Um, so one of the things that actually is worth pointing out, uh, going back to uh, Bruce Lane and uh, Simon van der Waal, they actually got in touch with each other before the Dina um, performance, they agreed to do a set together, uh, and they, despite being in different countries, I believe, they were actually able to build a good understanding of how each other worked and the kind of styles that they used um, through previously recorded uh, musical performances um, and just through experiments in shader toy so that uh, they could get an idea of what to expect. And so when they went into their performance, uh, they had a much clearer goal of how they would collaborate together. And it's worthwhile pointing out that uh, sort of a number of visualists, I find it's quite difficult to find uh, sort of any footage of what they do, what their style is. I'm personally very guilty of this. I don't think I have any YouTube videos I could give to somebody and say, this is the kind of thing I do. Um, and so it's sort of in terms of improving collaboration, really it's worthwhile thinking about how you are able to give this to somebody ahead of time. So. That was kind of the social side. I um, want to start touching on the technical side of this. Um, and, uh, because it, like, obviously, if you're collaborating with somebody, there's a lot of ways that you could uh, synchronize information and so on. Um, the obvious one is if you're observing the final output as a visualist, I can pull in a Fourier transform of somebody's audio. And there's loads of really good examples of this. Um, similarly, uh, you know, as a, uh, as a musician, um, observing the output of somebody's visuals and being able to use that to generate audio, sonify what they're doing. Um, and you know, this kind of uh, you know, uh, cooperation, this synchronization, it, it exists in many tools. Like it's not a novel thing. Um, unfortunately, it's not necessarily a silver bullet because whilst it helps, it means that you can miss some of the quite sort of uh, larger structures that are inherent within music. I mean, the obvious one, if we're talking about algorithm club music, is the drop. Um, if you are able to synchronize uh, visually and musically the point at which drops occur, then you know, that's going to be great for the dance music. Um, you know, this, the Fourier transforms will not help you with this. A lot of the observing the final outputs of somebody's music, they don't remove you as a visualist from having to think about what these structures are. Um, it's also worth pointing out that like, drops in club music are um, an obvious trope that don't always exist in algorithm music. And so uh, the question of what a musical structure is, what a phrase is, um, it's, it's already a lot looser. So it may be less important to uh, algorithm than it is to 
standard techno. Of course, if everybody could play standard techno at um, algorithms, my job as a visualist would be a lot easier. So maybe we should think about that. Uh, yes, so uh, one of the plus sides of it, though, is that as a visualist, I'm conscious that I want to make sure the performance is interesting and engaging. And in some ways, that means that I need to be constantly tweaking it. Um, and that means that I have to be much more in the moment and it's harder to kind of step back. Um, of course, if I have Fourier transforms, those kind of inputs, then it means that I should be able to worry about in the, like, small tweaking that much less um, and just focus on actually the larger structures in the performance. Um, and so there's definitely a place for these tools. I mean, we've all seen excellent examples of their usage, um, and I think it's worthwhile thinking about what they're actually being used for. Um, also, briefly, uh, an obvious example that some people use, and like, uh, there are uh, yeah, some artists are using, is just direct exchanging of messages via code. This can be as simple as syncing messages so that you have a consistent BPM. Um, I, like, Personally, I'm unaware of more advanced examples, but I'm sure there must be. And if anybody can come to me and say that I've forgotten things or don't know about things, that would be uh, great. Um, like OSC is a, message that, uh, a messaging format that gets used a lot within all the tools we use. Um, and I mean, even obvious things like agreeing, pre-agreeing uh, with your musician, um, messages that they can send to your visual so they actually have some control over what you're doing. Um, and these can be anything from sending patterns directly to uh, sending, you know, mood. Mood is purple, why not? Um, so there's a lot of uh, sort of free reign there. And perhaps the idea of tying this into the sort of language, uh, that intermediary uh, musical and visualist language that I talked about, um, there's quite a range of uh, possible research there. So one of the things that came up in the conversation as well uh, was this phrase, and uh, frankly, this is the best title I have ever had on a slide in a talk. I absolutely love it. Um, the aesthetics of incomplete synchronicity. And this is the idea that actually uh, constant synchronization between visuals and music isn't necessarily a good thing. I mean, it's uh, something that's worth bearing in mind. Uh, the phrase that got used was Mickey Mousing, which was a new phrase to me. Uh, for those un uh, unfamiliar with it, this is the, uh, that style in quite often old cartoons, where as Mickey Mouse moves, he moves his feet, and you have a trombone that moves in time, or the music is very lockstep with the actions that are happening on screen. Um, and it can be very effective in those old cartoons for comedy, um, you know, sort of these kind of moods. That may not be ideal for the performances that people are wanting to do. Um, and so it's this idea that partial synchronicity uh, is better than full synchronicity. And so if you are wanting to synchronize with what a musician is doing, um, like, why are you doing that? Uh, the example I got used uh, actually quite effectively, so this is uh, Michel Chion. He is a film theorist and composer. Um, and he talks about phrasing of films built around synchronization points. So this idea that uh, you have points in the film where the score and the uh, visuals will synchronize, um, and then over time those will drift out uh, and back in again, and this is how, in a film, you can build this idea of higher level structures um, of sort of phrases and passages and the tension and release. Um, and it was it felt like quite an important concept of what am I trying to synchronize and why. Um, so, in conclusion, hopefully uh, this has been interesting at this point. Um, there's definitely scope for, I mean, obviously there is scope for further improving collaboration between musicians and visualists. Um, and even with the algorithm setting where it can be quite freeform, um, there's a lot of sort of obvious things that could be good. The uh, idea of that shared language um, and maybe ways to implement that in the tools that we are using and often after talking at the visualist meetup yesterday, mostly building, um, there could be a lot of scope for that. Um, it's also worth, I mean, one of the things that I want to improve is having uh, a better body of work that I can share with uh, musicians prior to actually performing with them so that they have an idea of what it is that I'm trying to do. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Hopefully that's been interesting. Um, any questions? No questions? Oh. <laughs> Sorry, 
I just, I'm doing the, the bad thing of making a comment, not a question. But having been yeah, okay, one of the musicians involved in the author of the paper, there was one, one bit I wanted to kind of direct to the other musicians here. Um, because it came out of a conversation in Sheffield, and the bit where it said mood purple um, came out of a conversation where we were talking about bi-directional communication. So this idea of the visualist being able to send messages back to the musician. And there was a question that came up during another session in Sheffield, which is about what does the mood purple do to the audio? And you know, what is... Does the synth, you know, can the visualist send something that says, right, I'm shifting my visuals, how, you know, maybe synth textures or maybe patterns shift based on feedback coming back. So that's, I, I guess, a question out there to, to musicians to think about is how would they respond to a visualist going, that's the color we're playing with, how does that sound? And yeah, it was, uh, like you said, in the conversation, it wasn't just, uh, the communication wasn't just a one-way street. Um, the idea that yeah, visualists can, uh, in some ways, interact with what a musician is doing. Um, and at an algorithm, certainly, I think there's, there's already that expectation that, again, people are there for music, and so maybe the visualists are following the musician. But uh, if we understand that and we know about it, then there's no reason why we can't try and subvert that as visualists. Um, but, yeah, obviously, what would that do? How happy are musicians going to be with the visualist changing what they're doing underneath them? Uh, yeah, that's a question for the musicians, yeah. I have an actual question, not, not a comment. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting about algorithms being, like, coming from that 90s club culture of the music first. I mean, is that something we should look at subverting, do you think? I mean, as a visualist? Uh, well, you said subverting, sorry. But, I mean, should we really flip that? Should we actually have performances that have visuals first and then musicians less. Is that something you'd like to do? I mean, personally, it's something I'm definitely up for. Uh, again, it was one of the... So there were a lot of uh, ideas and discussion points that came up in the, the original conversation and some in the paper that I have kind of glossed over for the sake of brevity. Um, I mean, yes, I think there is definitely uh, scope for doing that. I, again, I think there's a lot of baggage that comes from what algorithms are or potentially trying to be with a more club-oriented night, and where does that line blur between is it an audio-visual performance or is it an algorithm performance, and do we primarily want people to dance? Um, yeah, I think everything's up for grabs, really, uh, is the answer. Um, but yeah, I think it's, again, organizing it. Yeah, yeah. Any other? I feel that a big obstacle in uh, in bidirectional communication between the musicians and the musicians and the visualists is that um, the musicians can't really see the visuals while they're performing, uh, and that's a very basic thing. If I can't see what the visualist is doing to my music, how can I adjust my music to that? So then, it sort of makes it a, a unidirectional uh, collaboration where the visualist. Um, has to sort of respond to what the music is doing, but there's no way of, of going, going around that. Um, how could we um, sort of fix that? Would, would the musicians be facing the screen help, but then they can face the audience? Uh, should they turn around every five minutes and see what's happening, but then they get distracted from their performance? Should they have the little monitor to see what the visuals are doing? Um, how do we fix that? I mean, yeah, so again, I found it really interesting what Alba was saying in her keynote about sort of these kind of things. Um, you know, what are the aesthetics of how you're setting the stage up? What can the musician see in this case? Um, I think certainly in a lot of the algorithms I've played at, everything is constrained by it being in tiny pub basements and them having a single projector and the musicians like, having very little control over how things are set up. Um, I mean, I think that certainly if it's easier for the musicians to see what visually is happening, then that's good. Um, I think also, it, like, I can imagine that plenty of musicians will be uh, very focused on what they're doing and find it quite difficult, perhaps, to look at separate visuals. Um, and, I mean, I think that uh, that's, again, something that comes down to individual musicians and whether you feel you have the uh, cognitive space to sort of look at something else and figure out what's going on. Um, and again, like it, musicians who have opinions on this, please come and talk to me about it. I'm very interested to know. Here, we have another one. Hi. 
Uh, well, I'm going to say something about musicians. I hope you don't feel bad. But I think musicians are kind of like rock stars. They want to be on the center. They want to be recognized as the ones that are playing. So <laughs> do you think this kind of dynamics that the musician has affects uh, the way visual is art? Because like, for me, uh, I really don't want to be on the stage. But I have to be on the stage because the musician is on the stage. So I don't know what you think about that. So, uh, so you feel you have to be on the stage because if the musician is on the stage and you want it to be clear you are performing as well, th then there's sort of that equality it, there. It's also a, a kind of communication with the musician because I usually will, uh, um, collaborate a lot with, com with composers and I do like to ask questions during the performance. So okay. sometimes I'm just communicating with the performance. But also it's very difficult for me because as you were saying, you cannot like, it's difficult to see your own visuals on your, uh, and also it's difficult for the musician to see your, uh, um, your visuals. So I don't know if it's an, like another arrangement will kind of like improve this collaboration process with others' performance? Uh, so, so I, I think part of that is also this kind of the, the hangover from 90s club music uh, and club nights where uh, the, the DJ in those cases is the focus. Um, and so I think that maybe there is that baggage around that's part of the reason the musicians seem elevated. Um, uh, I mean, in terms of visualist, yeah, maybe we do just have to aggressively subvert that. Um, but uh, in a friendly way, obviously. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know, to be honest. Like, I, th I think if you maybe get more used to bugging musicians and asking those questions. Um, yeah, I think for the, for the not sort of preferring not to be on stage, uh, but sort of feeling you need to be to talk to the musicians, I mean, it, yeah, I can understand that. I, I'll be honest, I don't have a particularly good answer for it at the moment, I'm afraid, but I'd like to discuss it more, yeah. Muchas gracias, thank you very much. That was in our time, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, now, welcome to Cine Vivo from Colombia. Um, they're gonna talk about a tool for live visual performance where code text can become a second layer of communication and visual information. And we have here Esteban Betancourt and Jessica Rodriguez. Colombia and Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. You can hear me, right? So, okay, I may speak in Spanglish. Uh, <laughs> we we just, both are going to speak in Spanglish. So, so sorry for the people that just speak English. <laughs> but, okay, well, we're going to try to live code or presentation, or paper presentation. Uh, Esteban is going to do that, and I'm going to explain a, a little bit more uh, about Cine Vivo. Uh, but I want to begin about the uh, start of Cine Vivo. So uh, we wrote this paper with my dad, who cannot be here. He, unfortunately, he's in Mexico, uh, but he's the other author. 
Um, when we start, well, I met Esteban a few, uh, a couple of years ago in Colombia, and we were um, working in, with another two friends in a piece called Leviathan. Um, well, Leviathan, I was just using Resolum. So I've been, <laughs> I'm, I'm always been bully, like software bully or code bully by the community of light coding because I haven't used like um, code to do my visuals. I usually do whatever I, I have in, in the moment. So um, I also wanted to not to use code just because everybody was bullying me and I was like, no, I'm not going to use code just because you told me to, <laughs> to, to do it. Uh, but at the end, I uh, had to approach um, code uh, because I, I needed to solve something like very particular uh, for this piece Leviathan and that's why we met Esteban and uh, the collaboration just like grow uh, grew from, the, from there. So that's kind of like how Stine Vivo started like it was like, a, like kind of like a personal um, approach. I wanted not to like work with code but I didn't want to work with vectors. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with Fluxors before, and I didn't like Fluxors, uh, so I just wanted to, to work with video clips, and that's kind of like the starting point when we talk with Esteban, and for that reason, we started developing uh, Cine Vivo, so that's kind of like the introduction. Uh, so the, sec the second part of the paper that is very, very important for us and for like my dad and me because we collaborate a lot with doing uh, performances is how we like see code. Like a lot of people, like right now we're just like talking about visualists against musicians or against musicians' code, but we have to understand the codes of the musicians are also a visual layer. And we have to respect that, that visual layer and we have to uh, learn how to work with that visual layer. So for me, uh, words have a very like personal and a meaningful, um, like meaningful, like I have, I have had meaningful experiences with words, how they look, how they sound, uh, so like our approach to code is from that part, not just the communication process with the computer or just the pedagogical process with the people sharing your code, but also how it looks, how it, uh, can you move the code through the screen, how uh, it, it sounds if you read it. Uh, so that's kind of the approach of how we see code as a, another layer or as a part of the visual layer in general. So um, this is Cine Vivo. I don't know if Esteban want to talk a little bit more about Cine Vivo. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm live coding right now in Cine Vivo. It's a natural language, but the point of Cine Vivo is not b to be a language. So I will talk about that later. Uh, Cine Vivo, in fact, is just a render engine uh, written in C++. Uh, it has a mini language uh, built in, but uh, as, as I said before, the idea is not to teach anyone to learn Cine Vivo language. It's just an interface if you don't want to use your own interface. Uh, so, for example, uh, I have a very good experience trying to teach people to uh, write its own interface or it, their own languages to interface with Cine Vivo language. For example, uh, at NIME in Virginia this year, uh, we made a piece with Jack, uh, Jack Armitage called Language Embodiment. So he wrote a mini interface in tidal cycles to interface with Cine Vivo. Then he was live coding title at the same time he was doing visuals. So it was great you have this presentation before us because uh, in, at NIME we got this OEC communication all during all our performance. I was doing visuals, he was doing music, but I was sending him OEC messages to all performance and he was sending me OEC messages through all performance. And then he was uh, controlling Cine Vivo with Tidal and I was controlling Tidal with Cine Vivo. So it was a great experience, um, for example, uh, and I, I know uh, about I, at least five other different kind of interfaces from people around the world that has worked with Cine Vivo, for example, with Pure Data or MaximSP. Uh, myself, I work with Chuck, and I used to work with Chuck 
or bash scripting to control Cinevivo. And for example, Jessica works with, and, and Regatron works with Super Collider. And that's the other thing we are going to talk about later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, obviously we may not be synchronized with the visual part, <laughs> with the light coding visual part. So I'm just uh, talking about other things. So one of the pieces that we explore here in the paper is Mother, that is an electronic uh, literature piece that we made for a conference in Montreal. Um, we made it with a poem, uh, with a short writing by my dad about uh, my grandmother who dies from cancer. So uh, language uh, was very important for him because my grandmother used to tell us stories like, and also my aunts used to tell stories and used to invent their own, their own stories. My dad says that they used to be writers without being like writing their stories. So uh, words had like a meaningful uh, thing, not just because we were inside this framework of the conference of electronic literature, but because uh, of this, uh, of our past. So we work with Cinevivo. Uh, we actually work with, uh, also with Adra which is like an spoiler alert for, the <laughs> for that paper. But we're working with Hydra, um, but in the last part of the performance, because it's divided on three, we work with Cinevivo, and I work with the Novena. I don't know if you uh, know the Novena, but obviously Mexico is a Catholic, uh, a very Catholic country. So when you die, uh, you have to pray for like nine days in a row. So uh, the, la the last section of the, this uh, story about my grandmother, it's remembering her. And by remembering her, we're doing the novena in the code part and um, showing some like video flowers on the, like, the, visual, the visual part. So uh, we work with the, something that Vitina Vivo has that you, ha you can name your own command. So like for example, instead of like just writing the number one, I, I just uh, change it for the name uno um, in Spanish, but I also use English, Spanish, French, and uh, Purepecha, which is a, a song from uh, Michoacan in Mexico. Um, the idea, well, I think uh, Esteban will agree with, with me. If not, I'm just going to say what I, I think. Uh, it, it was not about uh, decolonizing language. It's just about like mixing uh, what language can bring us, and visually and so soundly. Um, and so for that reason, uh, we wanted to mix. And uh, actually in the performance, my dad is reading in, in live, and we also have a, a second layer of uh, a reading in English. So we did also that with the code part. So m most of the commands, for example, lot was, or cargar, was duerme, which means sleep. Uh, so in the novena, like some of the things were like saying like uno duerme mamá, which means like one sleep mother. That's the first novena. So the second novena is tu duerme madre, uh, three a uh, tra duerme mamá, four duerme me mere, which is in French. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Cinco duerme amamba, amamba is mother in Purépecha. Seis, duerme mamá. Sept, duerme mere. Uh, with, duerme madre. Y no, uh, duerme mother. So the performance ends with antes del tiempo, which means before time, uh, which is in Cine Vivo translated into clean, just erase everything, uh, all the images that I have just loved. So. Yeah, we were playing with the expressivity of the code itself, but also how the code can also bring some images, uh, which were just like damasquina flowers or sempasuchi flowers that are very like connected with Mexican culture of the Day of the Dead, uh, del Dia de los Muertos. Yes. Uh, it was like everything connected. So uh, we wanted to show this uh, this example first because we were just just in Cine Vivo and the uh, possibilities of Cine Vivo by itself. But as Esteban uh, mentioned, uh, the idea of Cine Vivo is not just in it how it is, but you can also hack it or change it or just take it and do whatever you want and solve very particular uh, problems that you yeah, that you have, and then just all, uh, again share it with others. So we're gonna talk about two examples: the one that Esteban was talking and Orbit, which 
the one that we work with uh, with Pregatron. Okay, the, so I'm I'm going to be like 30 seconds super technical, but just to see what it's Cinevivo. Cinevivo is an application. Just, just you can render uh, whatever you want, uh, 3D models, shaders, um, render video, for photographs or text. Is, so whatever you want, you just communicate through OSC communication. Uh, all the repository is public, and I beg anyone wants to f destroy CineVivo. That's why exactly what I want to. Uh, I don't want anyone. I, I don't know anyone who has called me to say like, yeah, I'm I'm super genius in CineVivo language. That would be like, uh, I don't care about it. But it would be great. Someone call me and tell me like I just destroyed CineVivo, and that's great for me. The idea behind is that uh, uh, I would like that anyone, for example, Jessica, right now is talking about parsing and parsing through CineVivo, and I'm so happy because like two years before, it would be super hard to explain her what was to make a word translate into computer code or something like that. But I used to work with kids or not non-programmers, so that's the idea was that er anyone should first build a, a way, a natural way to interact with computers before trying to learn Python or tidal cycles. Even if tidal cycles is super fun against Python, but uh, if you don't even understand what do you want to tell or or you don't even understand English. Yeah. For example, Luis has talked about that into ICLCs, and so it's a very important thing. How do you, how, how can you learn, how can you even learn how, what's a programming language that's written all in English? So the idea here is just think and try to write what you think, and then there's this interface that can understand what you are trying to do and then the fun with the videos or whatever you want to do. So um, the first example I took was language embodiment. It was a piece built for the NIME, this 2018 NIME, uh, made with Jack uh, Armitage and me. Uh, it was a live coding piece for visuals and sound. Uh, as I said before, it's just an OSC communication live uh, between musician and visualist. Uh, it's a 10 minutes piece, and it's a, it's a very full. It's a full story. It's it has a, a specific sounds designed for specific visuals. Um, it's not a very random thing, and it's, uh, it's kind of a movie, uh, in fact. The, and the idea behind was that you can embody your language, and that's the idea behind CineVivo. It's like you have to live first, or your life, it's around what you think. You, and so that's why it's so important, language, and, and a language that you really understand, because logical blocks are logical just for expert programmers, not for non-programmers. <laughs> so, I, I I agree with you. I, we all have are very excited when we see these very big pieces of code, because we understand what happens there. But a kid or my mother will say like, "What? I I don't know what's happening." So <laughs> it's not exciting in that piece of code. Uh, so that's the idea behind behind language embodiment is a piece that has just like 15 pieces uh, li lines of code in natural English English French and Spanish um, and that's it so the other example it's orbit and uh, that's uh, the, that the first destruction of CineVivo I've seen <laughs> so Jessica is going to talk about that okay um, orbit uh, we use Orbit with the Regatron. I don't know if you uh, went to the first algorithm um, on Wednesday, uh, but we were using Orbit. Um, that's what one of the things that I forgot to say is that we also like collaborate with Emilio Ocelot and Marianne uh, Texido, which are also members of Regatron. 
uh, with Esteban. And at the beginning, we were just like, Esteban, can you just add like something like a glitch? Esteban, can you solve this? <laughs> and we were just like bothering Esteban all the time. So uh, what I like about Emilio is that he's obviously a musician. And I will encourage you to invite more visualists, but I will also encourage you as musicians just to do visuals and just maybe not to stop doing music, but sometimes on the algorithm say, I'm not gonna do music, I'm just gonna do visuals. Uh, so that's how we, all, we can also like have more uh, people doing visuals on, <laughs> on these kind of performances. So Emilio, is a, he, he's a musician he, and he started like getting very interested in the visual part. So he started investigating more about this part and also he started investigating more about Cine Vivo. And at the beginning, he just made like a library to connect uh, through OSC protocol, uh, Super Collider uh, to Cine Vivo, um, controller from Super Collider. And, but then he, he got like super excited and he started like hacking Cinevivo code and erasing all the glitches that, uh, like all the effects that Esteban had and just adding other things. And he also had like, uh, he was very interested, he's very interested on 3D, uh, which for example, I'm n I was not when we uh, produced Cinevivo, even though you can run uh, 3D models, but he was more into 3D modeling. So he started just adding a lot of, um, and things to work with cameras and orbit the camera, the length of the, of the camera. So this is like uh, orbit, and it has another uh, language. So it also has its own GitHub repository, um, which is in Emilio Ocelot GitHub, uh, which is also on the paper. Uh, so, so that's kind of like the idea behind orbit and how Emilio has been developing orbit in the last six months, I think. Um, so, yes. So, well, finally, like, we were, like, uh, rereading the paper, and I was thinking how to approach Cine Vivo uh, in an academic way. And I, I, I think, like, like, researching about Cine Vivo in a very ethnographic uh, way will be, like, a good, like, next uh, step, like how people have hacked Cine Vivo, how people have changed Cine Vivo, um, and how they uh, are adding their own questions or uh, their own personal approaches to visuals, and the interaction between visuals and sound. So I think that would be like a nice, uh, well, I don't have time right now, but <laughs> if I had time, uh, that would be like a nice next step. So yeah, I think that's all. I think in some in some part we will add the credits with which it has our names and also the GitHub repository for Cine Vivo. So again, like we invite you just to download it and just change it and share it. Excellent, thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Are there any? We have five minutes for questions. So. Can, you, can you just say very briefly how it works? Because I think what I understood is you have to essentially write your own language and associate that with clips or with OSC messages? I, sorry, I just didn't exactly understand how you set up a Cinevivo performance. Oh, there, there, there are a lot of ways. The first and, and the, 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 the first approach is that if you write super collider code, there's a, an OSC standard to interact with the Cinevivo render engine, so you just make your own interface in your super collider or whatever language you want, and then you write the interface to Cinevivo. That's the easiest way if you are an, uh, an expert programmer. The other way is you can do it in this screen. 
this is a text uh, text editor, simple, a very simple text editor. So you can customize a, a, every keyword in the language, a, a, and even you can do it live. So you can live code your live code language. So if you want that the variable name for one, it's one or uno or a cow or whatever word you want, you can just change change it on, on the fly in this same screen. Uh, it has right now a Spanish and an English uh, standard. So you, if you want this, the Spanish standard, you just write Spanish and then execute, and then you have the language in Spanish. If you, ha if you want the English standard, you just write English, and then you have all the keywords in English. But if you want Purepecha, for example, or any custom language, you can do it live if you want, or you can do it like in a press setup. You can write your own words and just learn the words. For example, for this presentation, I was live coding with a custom language that I just wrote like 20 minutes before the presentation. Um, <laughs> so I, I, it was very complicated, but, <laughs> but all, all the code you see, it was in fact uh, producing uh, changes between pictures and videos and all these things. And you can do it live if you want. So it's uh, the idea here is like I don't. Yeah, everyone should express in their own way. So if you want to change a word on the fly, you you should be able to do that. I will. I just I just want to say that. Um, well, I encourage everybody to do like more visual languages. Like for example, with story, like with the additions of the visual thing, the visual parts, like to visual languages, like I think it's a very nice thing. It's very nice to have like a gathering, like a visualist group, but it's also nice to encourage people to develop new languages from a visualist perspective and not like a musician's perspective but, too. And, and I would like to add something to Jessica said. I, 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 I came from music. I, I'm my undergrad is in guitar, and I was you know, rock player and then I have a heavy metal band and now I'm doing live coding and I don't understand anything about visuals until I'm working with visualists. So right now I know about a lot about because she's always asking me things and I was like, oh, visuals need these kind of things. <laughs> so right now I'm like very worried in my performances about the visualists because I've been working a lot with visuals. So I think that's one of the points you you made in your paper, so thank you. <laughs> yes. My advisor. <laughs> thank you both. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wonder if, if, if either or both of you have any thoughts about, um, to use the terminology of natural language dependent clauses or to use the vocabulary of programming languages, nested, or nesting, or, you know, tree structures. Um, like a lot of the, the language that we see you using there with Cinevivo, they're like, it's an independent clause by itself. Um, but in natural language, often we use dependent clauses as well, like, voy a Madrid, la yeah. ciudad que amo. It is a very different thing than just voy a Madrid. But so I, I don't know. I'm pointing at something. I'm just, yeah, no, I'm I know. Provoking you. <laughs> but 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 you are uh, you're right. I, I think about that a lot because it's not so easy to process natural language because, for example, Spanish has a lot of different variations or a, every Latin, uh, romantic uh, language is like French, Italian, and Spanish. It's very difficult to process like the difference between verbs depending of who is saying the verb and who is doing the action. But initially the, the idea is to just you know, to some, somehow to make it more natural to people that's normal programmers, but the project just goes in that way. Right now I'm trying to make a um, natural language processor a list for simple uh, kind of sentences in English that get this kind of variations, and that's why I'm trying to find a, a way to do it. Could be machine learning, could be 
I don't know, but that's, I, I think that's the project, this project goes that way, not in improving Cine Vivo, because Cine Vivo is not going to be improved anymore. Cine Vivo is going to be destroyed for whatever who wants to destroy it, but the idea behind Cine Vivo is that any, at any point at time, you should just talk to your computer, like, I want a video in that point, and the, the computer will put the video in that point. So it would be for up, like programming for what, my mother will program a, uh, that computer program if it's possible to say it that way. Like I want electronic music, or I want techno, and then the computer just does some kind of techno. It would be like the future work <laughs> it, when Tor Magnuson sell us their products. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think in a personal way, I think you can, with language, uh, like you can do more complex things, uh, mostly when you collide with other like artistic practice or with other practices. So, yeah, I think like the same with Cine Vivo, like in this stage, I don't think it will be improved more than what it is right now. Uh, but I think in personal projects, yeah, obviously, well, you have to consider more things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, our next paper is Live Coding Ray Marchers with Marching.js by Zero Ritz.
up there uh, a few months ago. So if you're ever coming through the Boston area and want to put together a show or something, get in touch. Uh, this morning, I'm going to be talking about a library I wrote for live coding ray marchers in the browser um, called Marching JS. Uh, and so I'll start off with a little bit of background info and some of the inspiration for it, and then uh, give a little bit of technical info, it might be more than 30 seconds, unfortunately, um, and, then, and then end with some demos. So I guess first, just to kind of show some of the related visual live coding environments, this is of course not a comprehensive list of, of visual live coding environments, but just some of the ones that make sense to talk about in this context. So Marching JS uh, fundamentally displays 3D geometries uh, and volume, does volume rendering, uh, and so some related libraries are listed there that also do 3D geometries, but they use a different rendering technique, which I'll talk about momentarily, uh, tessellation and rasterization. Uh, so these are libraries like Fluxus, Live Code Lab. Um, the old version of Jibber and the, the new version of Jibber that I'm working on will use Marching JS behind the scenes. We also have libraries that do full screen fragment shader programming for performance, like the dark side of the force, Code Life and Veda. Um, and Marching JS, actually what it does is you give a high level description of a, a, a geometric scene uh, shapes and, and transformations for those shapes, and then it compiles uh, a fragment shader for you behind the scenes. And this is the same approach that Hydra takes, at least to the best uh, of my understanding. So conceptually, in a lot of ways, this is actually similar uh, to, to what Hydra is doing. Uh, but the inspiration is very different. Instead of um, analog video synthesis techniques, uh, I'm drawing inspiration from things like this, which is a, an early demo scene uh, crack -trow video. Uh, so if, if you're not familiar with the demo scene, um, th this kind of started in the, the 80s when hackers were um, hacking uh, software to be able to release it freely. And then when they released the software, they would also add their own audio-visual kind of signatures um, to the program. So this was one that I saw many times when I was growing up, playing Commodore 64 games. <laughs> The music was actually a little less sophisticated than what you just heard in the Crack Tro video. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, so this, uh, eventually this community kind of moved away from just being part of the, the, the community that was hacking commercial software to make it freely available to creating these audiovisual demos as kind of standalone um, creative outputs. And so now we have a really different kind of demo scene community that, that's emerged. Uh, and so I'm going to show, and, and there's some interesting intersections with, with the live coding community. Maybe there, there'll be more in the future, I don't, I don't know. There's also some pretty substantial differences, I think, between the communities. So I'm going to show a, a video now from um, um, Revision 2017, which is the, the largest uh, demo scene conference that takes place annually. Uh, and this is the event finals of a shader live programming competition. Uh, just so you can get an idea of, of what these types of events look like. The end phase. Yeah, we're going to the six minute mark. This is the last two minutes. Cupid looking up going, holy shit. Quick sip of beer, important, beer important. If you want beer, we have beer available at the info desk. Beer is important in both. There's not much zooming into code here because the code itself isn't that interesting. It's all the fiddling with the numbers, um, fingering out the right colors, so all the right contrast, um, the right music zone. Okay, so you get these kind of uh, live commentaries and this, you know, this pumping music, and uh, these people are are, are competing. Uh, which is really interesting. And, and so the, a lot of the, the standard techniques that are used for doing these, they have to write these shaders from scratch, um, and they, they use ray marching uh, techniques to create these kind of volumetric, interesting forms. And so uh, live coding a ray marching 
a rate marcher from scratch takes a long time. And if you actually go to the five or six minute mark here, I mean, we're seeing blank screens as they slowly build up this, this rain marcher. It takes quite a bit of time. So I wanted to be abstract the idea of the rain marcher, make it easy for live coders to use, kind of have a pre-built system for being able to take uh, volumetric shapes and uh, render them to the screen. So a little bit of, about what the differences between these are. This is where it'll get a little bit technical. Um, so first, the standard way that we do render 3D geometries is through a process of tessellation and rasterization. rasterization. This is going to be super high level. Um, so to tessellate an object, basically we're just subdividing that object into triangles. So here's a, fear, a sphere that's been subdivided into triangles of, of various resolution. Uh, and then we take each of the vertices for these triangles and submit those vertices uh, in an array to the graphics card. And the graphics card then takes those vertices, reassembles them into triangles, and then um, projects the triangles onto the screen. And that's how 3D geometry is in, in, in most uh, live coding environments, most, most graphics programming environments actually get rendered. They're subdivided into triangles, and then uh, those triangles are then projected onto the screen. And so this means that in, um, when you're manipulating these types of forms, you're really thinking about manipulating triangles and, and vertices as opposed to the underlying mathematical formulas that, that build up uh, the geometries. So ray marching works differently. Uh, in ray marching, we have a camera that is shooting rays through every pixel in the screen, uh, marching through each row by row, column by column. And each ray that goes through each pixel, it goes into our, our virtual scene, and you go through and you sample it periodically to detect whether or not the ray hits an object as it moves from the origin of the camera through one pixel on the screen and into the virtual environment. If it does strike an object in that scene, that you determine what the color of that object is, and that's the color that gets assigned to that particular pixel. Uh, and this means that these shapes that we have inside of our environment can be described entirely mathematically, and you just use uh, some basic maths to determine whether or not the rays strike them. And so here's a really simple example of a, the formula for uh, determining if a particular point inside of a virtual scene uh, strikes a sphere. Basically, you just need to know the radius of that sphere. You kind of make the assumption that the sphere is in the center of the virtual scene, and you can do some other basics math to offset the position if you want. And then you just take a look at the x, y, and z values of, of the, the point that you're looking at and get the Euclidean distance of that point. Subtract so the radius. If the value is less than zero, then the point that you're sampling is inside of the sphere. If it's zero, it's on the surface of the sphere. And if it's greater than zero, then you've not hit the, not hit the sphere. And so these functions are called distance functions. They return a distance value. Again, if it's a negative distance value, then that means you're inside of the geometry. And you should return a color for that particular ray. Uh, so once you have distances, it's very easy to combine shapes in different ways uh, using ray marching techniques. And this is something that's also uh, different from more traditional graphics rendering techniques, or I shouldn't say traditional, but this, this process of tessellation and rasterization. So to combine two shapes together, we just look at the two distances returned by those distance formulas, and we see which one is smaller, and then that's the value that we, that's the color that we wind up returning the color for that particular geometry. And there's lots of other interesting operations you can do um, th that are very simple and efficient on the GPU for combining these things in different ways. <clears throat> OK, so that's the pure technical part. And so now I'll do some demos. So this is um, available here, charlieroberts.github.io slash marching slash playground if you want to play around with it while I'm talking, please feel free. Um, when you started, it just looks like this. There's some code to get you started, and there's a bunch of different demos. I don't know if all of these will come up. So here's like a volumetric super formula. Um, here's a, a snare drum, a piccolo drum that I've kind of built just by combining these shapes together with different geometric combinators. Um, there's other kind of pure volumetric rendering things like fractals. Um, here's another example of a more complex shape that's just made by combining 
um, simpler forms in different ways. So in this case, I'm taking a torus, which is just a ring, and I'm just repeating it, uh, doing a polar repeat to create a circle of rings, and then I'm rotating that circle of rings, and then I'm repeating it along a circle again. So I basically have a circle of circle of rings, and that creates this kind of more complex form that you're seeing right here, uh, along with a, a ground plane that the form intersects with. And so you can kind of gradually build up these more complicated forms um, by combining these things together. And so I think what I'll do next is just kind of uh, do a demo of building up one of these more complicated forms and then show how you would animate that and engage with it in the context of a live coding performance. Uh, so why don't I, I'll make this full screen. Ref okay, okay. So I'll start off just by um, making a simple sphere. And I'm going to tell that sphere to render. Um, and so basically, everything that you put inside of this march function becomes the kind of description of the geometries that you would like to render. Uh, and so now I'm going to take that sphere, and I'm basically trying to repeat the, the shape that we had when we, I first launched the page. Uh, and so I'm going to make an uh, infinite field of these spheres using the repeat operator. And I'll tell it to repeat every four units um, on the x, y, and the z axis. And if you just give one number, it's kind of a syntax, a sugar, syntax sugar for, for that. So I do that, and we get a, a kind of this infinite field of sphere that happens. And so now what I want to do is take this infinite, I guess I should point out, uh, here's like a key difference. So if we were doing this with tessellation and rasterization, for every one of these spheres, I would have to be subdividing that sphere into triangles and then taking all of the vertices for each one of those triangles, submitting them up to the, the GPU to be rendered, and it, it becomes computationally much less efficient uh, than the operations that, that we're seeing right here. Although there are a lot of things in ray marching that are more expensive um, than uh, rasterization and tessellation. So I'm gonna take this infinite field now and I'm gonna bind it inside of another sphere, and that's uh, done using the intersection combinator. So I'll say sphere, it's gonna have a radius of three. And I'll stick a comma here. And so you can sort of see now that there's spheres bound inside of another larger sphere, but the spheres are kind of big and they're far apart from one another, so I'm gonna make them a little bit uh, smaller and I'll make them close together. Uh, and then you get a shape that looks like that. Oops. So next thing I want to do is take this and, and, and animate it over time and make it um, audio reactive. Uh, by default, when you render a, a shape in Marching JS, it, it's, it renders at super high quality, which is it, most GPUs you can't render at the maximum quality setting um, in real time. So I'm going to turn the quality setting down and I'm gonna add a flag to turn on the dynamic rendering so that it renders uh, once per frame. And then I'm gonna make a function called onFrame, uh, which is gonna accept a time value. And then I need to give the different objects in my scene uh, a name so that I can be able to access it. So I'm just gonna assign this to the variable s. And I'll say s.radius equals, let's do time mod three. And so now you get this kind of weird shape where the, the sphere that's bound, binding this, this field of spheres is gradually increasing in size, and as, it, as the intersections with all the spheres that are inside uh, change, you get this kind of warbly effect that accompanies the expansion. Um, I can also do things like, say, um, change the transition point between the, the, the larger element that's, that's holding the repeating sphere. So right now it's an abrupt transition but I'll, I'll make it a, a, a stepped transition instead. Maybe slow this down a little bit uh, so that you can see the, the steps a little bit more. So now we kind of have this shape that's going. Uh, maybe I'll add some rotation to it and I'll rotate it over time. I'll tell it to rotate along the X and the Y axis.
And so last but not least, I'm going to turn the autocur back on, and I'll add some audio to it. Uh, so I can just say FFT start to start the FFT rendering. And we'll just take this, and instead of doing time, I'll say FFT low times two. Uh, another fun thing to do is to take the, the repetition and change the distance by assigning it to the FFT. Um, so here I'll say repeat.distance.x equals FFT.mid. So now you kind of have these planes that are kind of shrinking and compressing depending on uh, the results of the audio analysis. Cool. So yeah, going forward, this is going to replace the, the graphics library um, inside of Jibber. Um, right now, I feel like the, the output is kind of uh, techno-y, cold, and um, uh, I am looking forward to maybe adding some types of post-processing shaders to, to the system to give it more grid, or maybe feeding the output into Hydra to, to mess with it inside of there. Um, uh, and I think with that, yeah, I'll just say uh, thanks to Chi Shen who initially uh, started work on this project um, and to all the repos that I stole code from. Uh, and if you have a chance to try it out and give me feedback, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Okay, any questions? So my understanding from doing some amount of sort of ray tracing and uh, graphics, but definitely not being a shader expert by any means, was that ray tracing and ray marching were uh, actually quite inefficient to do on graphics cards. Mm -hmm. um, uh, am I just totally incorrect, or is there some other kind of magic going on here to make it work better within shaders and better parallelize things? Yeah, so when you talk about ray tracing, there's there's a bunch of, of differences, but w one of them is typically that um, you have lots of bounces of the rays to determine reflections and shadows and uh, refractions of light. And each one of those bounces, you're basically creating additional rays, and that makes it a lot more complex. Um, with ray marching, there's typically one ray, and then there's maybe some hacks to simulate things like shadows uh, um, and lighting effects. So it's not quite um, as bad. Um, it, it is certainly more expensive uh, computationally than like to, to even just to render a sphere than it would be if you were using tessellation and, and rasterization. Um, so uh, if you have a not so great graphics card, you, you kind of have to turn the resolution of your screen down and turn the quality setting of the rendering engine. Uh, remember, there's that coefficient in the code that lets you set that to a, a lower setting if you're having problems. OK, any other question? Uh, are you? kind of um, planning on integrating uh, GLSL as well in the language so that it could be kind of like a hybrid. So you could have like the high level margin JS and maybe embed some post-processing directly in GLSL in the same um, code view. Yeah, maybe when I bring it into Jibber, I might, I might look into doing that. I think, um, I think the, the library itself is probably just gonna stay solely in the realm of, of uh, outputting these um, uh, ray marching shaders. But uh, yeah, as, as I bring it into Jibber, um, I think that, yeah, that would be a nice thing to, to be able to add to it. Any other question? Uh, hi, uh, I was wondering if, it, if it's possible to transform uh, 3D models into this uh, and to use it with this technique um, uh, uh, 
those are maths beyond me. So uh, I mean, you can you can make the 3D models. I guess I kind of showed some examples. You can sort of assemble your own by taking these smaller components and then making things. But if you want to bring in like a mesh, um, I mean, the whole idea is of the mesh is that it's already gone through this process of, of tessellation uh, to divide it into to triangles. Um, I guess I, maybe there's somebody, I'm sure there's somebody with better graphics knowledge than me that could talk about what that would mean to bring a mesh into a, a, a ray marching environment. I don't, I don't know how to do it. Um, I don't, sorry. Um, is it possible to get access to the actual fragment coordinates uh, so that they, you can modify the space itself in addition to the objects? Uh, sorry, to get access to what? To, to the fragment coordinates. So, so in GLSL, for example, you have um, uh, the frag chord X, Y, um, so the position of every pixel, basically. I see. Okay, yeah. Is it possible to manipulate the space uh, in addition to the actual objects? No, so yeah, again, that would have to be some additional post-processing editor that would need to be tacked on on, on, on top of this, uh, maybe in Jibber or, or some other program. It, it is a standalone library that there's instructions, I think, on the GitHub repo on how to bed it in your own project. So if you wanted to just feed uh, that as a frame buffer into something else, you, you could do that. Anyone else? OK, so I guess. That was it. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thanks. Our next presenter is Olivia Jack from San Francisco. And she created Hydra, and she's going to talk about it. We're going to be talking about Hydra, which is a library and platform and sort of ongoing investigation that I've been working on for the last year. Um, it's online. It's in the browser at, at this website. Um, and you can use it from the browser or you can use it, uh, you can download it and use it with an Atom text editor. Um, it's written in JavaScript, or, and there's various pieces to it that are all modular, so you can either use it within the editor online, or you can um, use little pieces of it within other projects. Um, but actually, it started for me, I was interested in learning about certain things and sort of investigating them. Um, analog video synthesis, collaboration in visuals, and, and streaming protocols on the web. And I actually like wasn't planning on making a live coding library at all, but I started investigating these things and found that the easiest way to, to interact with them was by writing code and seeing what happened in real time. And so uh, the live coding interface to Hydra grew out of, out of that process. Um, and it's great to go right after Charlie because now we all have an introduction to, to graphics programming. But um, in terms of existing 
ways of making graphics with code. Uh, this is a processing window and, and processing. Um, my understanding is that the creators of processing had a, somewhat of a design background and were interested in replicating certain things from design such as um, uh, just the idea of, of drawing things, of color, of layout, um, and using certain metaphors such as draw, such as having a canvas, making shapes that are are familiar to a design a design world or something. And so in processing, if you want to draw, you can draw one circle, or if you want to draw a bunch of circles, you have to have a loop and repeat um, that process a bunch of times. Um, and then I think a lot of things like Canvas on, uh, like HTML Canvas or software like Illustrator use that sort of, those sort of metaphors on the computer of like, oh, we're drawing shapes. Um, and then, uh, then there's also more 3D rendering things that use these metaphors, I guess, or abstractions for 3D rendering where you have um, a mesh and lights and um, a scene. And, and all these like words to describe them help sort of understand the way, the way of interacting with them. Um, and so in contrast to those, those ways of creating graphics, because actually, as Charlie mentioned, really when everything gets to the graphics card, the graphics card doesn't know what, the graphics card doesn't know what a square is, it doesn't know what a, a string is, it doesn't know it doesn't have data, it doesn't know what anything, what any of these things are. The graphics card works, it's only determining the color of each pixel on the screen. And so all of these like things that we use, oh, I'm gonna draw, or, or even if I'm doing something just on the CPU, at some point that's getting sent to the graphics card and the graphics card doesn't actually know what it is, uh, if that makes any sense. <laughs> um, and so, uh, in Hy Hydra, I, I wanted to play with analog modular synthesis, but don't have, have any of this equipment, so I just kind of started reading about it and, and replicating certain, certain aspects of this. Um, and I guess uh, when I say it's inspired by an analog modular synthesis, um, one of the things I mean is that the, the idea that, that all of these sort of boxes, each one has a function um, where it receives a signal and outputs a signal and, and what happens within that box uh, is up to that sort of box to decide in a certain way. And so because of that, you can rearrange these things in lots of different ways and rearranging them um, creates lots of, of possibilities because even if you just have six things and then you can rearrange them however power to six to the power of something ways, then you, you already have a lot of possibilities. Um, and, and like the boxes in an analog context translates to, um, uh, like could translate to functions in a, in a programming language. Um, uh, th this is a, an analog synthesizer created in the 70s called Sandin image processor. Um, and I'm gonna be referring to this kind of a lot in my presentation, but it's similar to a lot of analog synthesizers that were created in the same, in the same period, but I have more references from this one. Um, uh, so yeah, well, one thing that the creator of this said about the synthesizer is the modules are designed to maximize the possibility of interconnection thereby maximizing the number of, of possible modifications of the image. Um, and so, oops. Um, so in Hydra, um, uh, each, each function directly corresponds to a function that runs on the graphics card, and so, um, let me see. I thought it, it might be, I put the, the graphics card code below the JavaScript code because that might be interesting for some people. Um, 
And so each, each actual JavaScript function is either a transformation of coordinates or a transformation of color. Um, and, or a transformation from color to coordinates or a transformation from coordinates to color. And so actually what a fragment shader is in any graphics card pro program, that's a, uh, including what we just saw uh, with Charlie, which is really complicated and lots of equations, any graphics card program, pro program really is a transformation from a coordinate to a color, and it runs simultaneously on every pixel. And so this function that's just gradient uh, corresponds to this uh, graphics card function uh, that just says, give, pass me the coordinate and then return a color. And so that creates a gradient because here, based on the coordinate, it outputs a color. Um, and so when we add another thing, like repeat, um, repeat's just a transformation of the coordinate space. And so it's just adding a new function. My mouse is moving itself. Um, <laughs> uh, so repeat transforms the coordinate space and, and um, before doing that final transformation it adds another transformation of the coordinate space. Um, and so just having these sort of simple little pieces of transforming colors or transforming coordinates and then adding them together um, it, it can lead to quite complex things. Uh, so, so rotates another transformation of, of, of a coordinate space. Um, in Hydra, again, all of these things are, tr in this case, all of this is, is rendered to a sig single fragment shader, which is basically C, C code. Um, and and there's no wrong parameters for anything. So, so a lot of times if I'm, oops, if I'm teaching people Hydra, I just say like, open some code and start playing with the, new, the numbers and there's no actually like wrong number um, <laughs> you can use. Uh, yeah, and you can also use a camera <laughs> and do, and uh, apply the same sorts of of transformations to the camera. Um, and then, <laughs> um, okay, so, so until now, all the things that I've done, it's all rendered to a single shader. And so with, with programs where people are writing shaders, they usually just use one shader live. Um, but I was kind of interested in this idea of feedback and being able to route a lot of things into each other. And so um, in Hydra, you can have various canvases that are rendering different shaders and then use them to feedback sort of into each other. And so here I'm rendering a gradient pattern in, in the top uh, in one shader and then I'm rendering my camera in the other, in the other shader. I'm just gonna make it move because that's more fun. Um, uh, and so now I have these two, these two things and now I can actually mix them together. And so um, uh, I can use, the, the sources are called O0 or O with a number after them. And then I can say b blend it with O1 and then I'm gonna output it to O2. And so now uh, I'm blending my two, my two shader things together. Um, uh, yeah, so there, and, and um, yeah, the blending is like uh, with Photoshop or kind of graphics tools, but when it actually, when you say something like add, it's actually just going pixel, going through each pixel and just adding the values of each pixel or diff is, is taking the, the difference absolute value between, between pixels. So, um, 
I think it's been, it's been, I guess, teaching this. Sometimes it's an interesting way for people to think differently about software they might use a lot, like Photoshop, but actually think of it as adding pixels together. Um, and so what we, uh, oh, so adding or multiplying is like um, doing arithmetic on two pixel colors. But then uh, we could also use the pixel colors to affect the coordinate system or the coordinate system to affect the pixel colors. And that's where sort of the, the fun hydra functions come in, which is the, the modulate. Um, and so modulate, it's kind of hard to see, let's see. But um, my face is kind of warping the other texture. And so that's using the color of each pixel to determine how the coordinate system is shifted. Um, and so that's, that's fun. Um, and then also, you don't have to render everything to its own texture and then combine them. So this is that same thing that we just did of having a gradient and having some transformations and rotating and everything. Uh, and then it's being modulated with the camera, but it's all within the same shader because actually here there's nothing really creating feedback. Um, uh, and I guess one last thing is that anything in Hydra that's a number can also be a function. And so, uh, let's see. Yeah, anything, anything that's a number can be a function. And so... Uh, I could make the number of repetitions as a function of time. I think it's already really big. Uh, let's see, let's do a sine of time. Sine time. Uh. Anyways, and that's useful so you can use MIDI input or use OSC messages or having it be a function kind of just opens it up for for what, what any any variable value for each number. Uh, and then now we get to my favorite part, which is feedback. Uh, oops, and I had it. Oops. Um, so feedback in in video is it. In, in the 70s or whatever, with analog video synthesizers, it's people taking a camera, pointing it at, at the monitor, and then uh, the monitor is showing the output of the camera, and that output of the camera becomes the input uh, to the camera itself. And so then you get this recursive system where nothing's really the beginning and nothing's really, really the end of it. Um, and so... In Hydra, that's, that would be something like, uh, so, so here I just have a, a shape, um, and then I can repeat the shape. Uh, and then uh, what I'm going to do is use feedback to make a fractal. And so a fractal is something where at each scale it's a repetition of itself. And so because feedback is using itself as an input to itself, um, if, I, if I use the output of this as an input to itself, uh, then we get a fractal uh, sort of thing. Um, and so... Uh, this is infinitely fa fascinating to me, actually, <laughs> is to make abstractions to be able to play with these kind of things because, as Charlie mentioned, j to write an entire shader code to do this is a lot more complicated, but to create little pieces that you can mix and match, and in this case, it's just mixing and matching sort of coordinates and colors has a lot of um, possibilities. and. And actually, someone in the 70s, uh, Jim Crutchfield, wrote about the computational properties of, of video feedback. Uh, 
And so this is an entirely analog system. It's not, it's not a computer at all. It's just a camera pointed at its monitor and then modified in certain ways. Uh, and he talked about how this is actually useful in simulating complicated things like fluid dynamics and um, reaction diffusion and other things. And he wrote out the differential equations that, that this uh, uh, can simulate. And so I think it's not a Turing complete computer, a video feedback system, but it, it is a computer in that it uh, can compute a lot of things that are really complicated and modern graphics cards are just starting to be able to, be able to do. Um, uh, and so I think it's been, for me, it's been an investigation into these things and then sort of as I go along trying out different things and, and again, a, f a fluid can be, something like a fluid can be, um, what's it called, can be modeled with, with this system because in the fluid, instead of each pixel color corresponds to something like pressure or density, and then that, uh, that, that pixel color is translated into a movement. And so it's sort of a way to, for me, kind of more intuitively understand these things that are really complicated mathematically in terms of equations. Um, and so, yeah, this is a re reaction diffusion. The code's not showing up, but anyways. Um, uh, yeah, and something, oh, I was gonna go to this later. Uh, uh, one thing that Daniel Sandin said about this that's inspiring to me is he says, put yourself in a feedback loop. The reason you put yourself in a feedback loop is so you can learn something or rather learn to do something. You know, you do something and the results get processed somehow, perhaps just by yourself just looking at it uh, and do another thing and the results get processed and he talks about, with, in the case of video synthesis, having this possibility to change it in real time um, as, as allowing a lot of creative possibilities. And so this is in the 70s, but I think it's, for me it's really relevant to live coding because uh, even though I've made the entire, the entire software, I don't know what's gonna happen each time I use it. And so being able to change it in real time um, is like putting myself into the feedback loop or something. Um, and so uh, I think it's, this is inspiring to me, not just as a way to interact with the software, but also like in general as a continually adapt, adapt and, and evolve. Um, and yeah, in Hydra you can use lots of different sources. So this is a processing canvas. This is using the screen itself as a source. This is using the screen itself with a transparent window, which was like really mind-blowing to me. <laughs> um, or this is uh, using a live feed of a uh, New York Times and an aquarium, and then uh, seeing what happens. And, uh, and then also, if someone else is connected to the software, you can use what they're doing as an input, as a video texture into what you're doing. Um, and that's something I want to explore more. I still feel like I'm just starting to understand what to, what to do with it. Um, and to end, my final, oh, okay, I put these in the wrong order. My final thing, this is again from that same, uh, same video synthesizer in the 70s, but the technical manual is called Distribution Religion. Um, and had a note that said, uh, when you open the technical manual, oh, it's not, that says, uh, the image processor may be co copied without charge. For uh, profit institutions, has to negotiate to copy. Um, basically, this is before open source software exists. The idea of free software. Uh, this is in the 70s, and and the idea of sharing this information, uh, which to me is one of the reasons why I like putting everything on the browser and also making ways of people sharing what they're doing. Um, Anyways, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Olivia. Any questions? We have some minutes left for questions, comments. No?
what are the current directions of development that you're looking at with Hydra at the moment? Because obviously you've built this great tool. Uh, where do you want to take it? Um, I want to make it easier to, like, my dream world is that you could mix and match lots of things as needed, like sort of JavaScript. Or, or I guess they don't have to be JavaScript things. But I just like this, like, mix and match anything. And so not just using vi mix and match visual inputs, but, for example, make com being able, oh, today I want to use Charlie's marching with this, with a machine learning library with, and I want to explore ways to make that really easy and intuitive because right now I clone Hydra each time I want to add new things to it. Um, it does have processing built in so you can use a P5 canvas with the, um, so that's one of the directions. I want to continue documenting it better because I haven't even really made documentation, I don't think. And then this is something I just did that I'm excited about, which is, it's basically a, a gallery for sharing uh, sketches in the form of a Twitter bot. But basically, if you go to it and you click on a link, um, it just opens directly to the code that someone's, that someone's written. And so then you can, and, and actually the, the code is embedded in the URL. And so if you share that URL, you can immediately see the code. And, um, and so this is something that Will Humphreys just did this morning or something. And now I can, I can edit it and uh, change it. And then I can actually upload it. Now I'm going to upload live an ICLC sketch that we just did. <laughs> and so it should show up on the Twitter. And when you go, you actually see not just my sketch, but you see what um, the original it was and to see maybe how some things evolved. And so that's something I'm working on right now. I'm excited about this idea of collaboration um, in that way. Hola, Olivia. Te voy a preguntar en España. Este, eso no nada más es como de Hydra, creo que en general. Eh, ¿Cómo piensas que, que siento que a veces algunas como programas o algunas plataformas eh, determinan eh, la estética de lo que presentas. Entonces, luego no importa, y esto también pasa en sonido, por ejemplo, con Tidal es, es muy recurrente, luego no importa que alguien más esté haciendo el performance, es la misma estética. Entonces, no, no importa el performer, sino más bien el performer es, es la plataforma por sí sola. Entonces, ¿qué piensas sobre eso? O sea, si, ¿Cómo combatir esto? O, o, o a lo mejor no hay que combatirlo, que como... No sé si me entienda. La pregunta es si ¿sí hay una estética de Hydra o si... Que, que... Sí, o sea, si sí sí, ya tiene embebida una estética y entonces no importa quién, quién lo esté programando porque siempre va a ser la misma estética. Pero entonces ahí hay cuestiones como dónde queda la individualidad, individualidad estética. Pues yo siento que todos lo que lo usan, lo usan de forma diferente. Por ejemplo, yo sí, sí, creo que sí hay una estética en bebida, pero cuando tú importas tus propios videos o tú, pues, bueno, esas son, so, esas son cosas que otras personas han hecho y yo nunca me hubiera imaginado esto. Entonces, para mí no todo tiene la misma estética necesariamente. Uh. Hi, Olivia. Uh, I would like to ask, what's your, um, um, how do you do the research in terms of the operations that you were describing? Um, for instance, um, adding or, or mod modulating. And uh, I, I'm interested because at some point you mentioned that you um, like a parallelism with Photoshop operations. So my question, maybe more specific, is did you um, were had like previous experience with photo, Photoshop, and from there you translated those operations. Like I, 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 I'm not a visual visualist, so I don't know the common practices. Maybe that's those are common operations, but um, I don't know. I would like you to explain more. Yeah, I partly did a lot of shader tutorials and learned a lot about graphics programming, and so a lot of that was trying to. I wanted to get to a certain place to be able to experiment with a certain thing and then wrote code to make it easier to get there. But then things like uh, the Photoshop things are pretty common in 
almost any video editor where there's uh, some sort of way of compositing one image with another, because maybe with sound, if this makes a sound and this makes a sound, you can hear both of them, but if an image, if this image is here, there's no other, it, that image is there, so there has to be some way that the two things are shown, either, oh, they're shown in different places, they're added together, they're, um, and so, so those, the Photoshop things are just how to show more than one image at once. Okay, that's all the time we have. Thank you very much, Olivia. That was great. And, uh, we are we are 15 minutes behind the schedule, so if we want to have lunch in time, I would suggest to make a, a shorter break. Uh, we have a we're supposed to start at 12, and that's in two minutes. So if we, you can come back in 12, 10 minutes for the next session, that would be great. Thank you very much. <laughs>